Hello guys, welcome to the episode number 9 of mountain bike rear suspension series. Today we will talk about the damper, okay? And I will show you that uh, IFP, which is the chamber that pressurizes the damper, the oil in the damper, also acts as a spring, okay? So theoretically, typically, the damper is viewed as a, a dissipator of the energy of the spring, okay? So the damper controls the energy of the spring. However, since the, the damper is pressurized by an IFP chamber, also known as nitrogen chamber, uh, this chamber also acts as a spring. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, it's really hard to compress. Okay? So it produces a breakaway force. You have to, to do a certain amount of pressure to to start compressing the damper and indeed it acts as a spring because it also uh, rebounds, okay? So I will try again Okay, so let's measure and quantify uh, how the IFP affects the, the, the spring, the overall spring of, of your shock Okay, so just to be fully clear about this when you compress the shock there are three forces that you need to counteract. You need to counteract the force of the spring, which can be a coil or air spring. Then you also have the force of the damping, okay, compression damping force, which is caused by the, the restriction of the oil flow, caused by the chains and also by the valves, okay, so that's the compression damping. And then you have also the IFP force, since this is a this is a pressurized chamber, okay. So this also produces force in the in the shaft. So to avoid confusions in this video, I will talk only about the the force that IFP produces, and not I will not talk about the compression dumping forces, okay. Also, in the last episode, I talked to you about the breakaway, and indeed, I realized now that I missed a key. An important aspect in that test. So I will also correct uh, that test and give you a new information about the unsprung weight. So let's start. Okay, so in the last episode I showed you how to measure the breakaway force. However, many of you ask me if they need to subtract the weights of the, st the static weight of the bike. And I told you that you don't need to subtract this, this weight value of the static, the static weight of, of the bike. Indeed, you don't need to subtract this value, but you need to subtract the unsprung weight of your bike. So I will just show you the, uh, quickly the difference between the unsprung weight and the static weight of your bike in the rear wheel. Okay, so check, check this out. So, do you want to see another cool thing about the unsprung weight? So, do you remember the, the drop test? Now, just check this out. How cool is that, huh? <laughs> So in my case the breakaway was 7 kilograms at the wheel, okay? Since I know that my bike has an initial leverage ratio of 3.5, this means that the breakaway force of the shock is 3.5 times higher than at the wheel. 
So this means that the breakaway force of the shock is about 25 kilograms of force. So I only can compress the shock if I apply it more than 25 kilograms of force on the shaft. So let's do the force. Okay, compressing. Okay, 21 kilograms more and less of breakaway force. So indeed, the force, um, the force that the damper produces on the shaft, is is very easy to calculate. It it just it's equal to the pressure of the IFP times the area. Okay, the sectional. Okay, the sectional area of the shaft. Okay, so by just knowing the diameter of the shaft, you can calculate very easily um, the force that the IFP produces on the shaft. So let's do the maths and I will show you some graphs. See, since I have the technical drawings of this particular shock, I can know exactly with great precision the volume of the, the IFP chamber in this shock. And as you can see, I need about 80 kilograms of force to fully compress this, this damper, okay? Just to confirm this theoretical graph, I will measure the force of the damper in the reality and compare with the theoretical graph. Because okay, so I measured I measured the force at the rear wheel needed to compress the shock. After normalizing with the unsprung weight and the the, the leverage ratio of, of my bike for each uh, each given moment, after doing that calculations, this is the 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 result that I obtained. Okay, so in blue you have the the real values that I measured in the reality, and the, in orange you have the theoretical values. As you can see, there is a pretty good match. The match is not perfect because this weight scale method is also not very accurate and also probably I also have some influence of the compression dumping in, this, in these results. But nevertheless, the results are pretty similar and as you can see, there is a, a very good match for the breakaway force and for the total force to bottom out the, the IFP. Okay, so now let's compare the IFP produced forces with the forces needed to fully compress the spring and see how much percentage does the IFP contribute to the overall spring of spring rate of, of your shock. Okay, so in my case I need about 450 kilograms of force to fully compress this spring, okay? So given that the, the IFP produces about 80 kilograms of force this means that it's almost the, the IFP contribution to the overall spring rate of the shock is almost 20%. Okay, so depending on, on the type of shock that you have and your weight and depending on the, the, spring, the spring rate, I would say that the, the IFP will contribute with around 10 to 25% uh, of force. Just as a final curiosity, until now I used 200 psi in the boost valve pressure and now I will use 125 psi which is the minimum pressure recommended for this shock. So according to the theoretical graphs with 125 psi I will get a breakaway force of 12 kg instead of the 20 kg that we often previously. So let's let's check it out if this is true or not. Yeah. 
In the last episode, uh, I asked you to do the weight scale test and send me the, the results for your breakaway forces. So, I have collected uh, since then 11 results, so which is a quite uh, good number of results. And honestly, I was expecting a, a huge variability on the, on the results. Indeed, that was not the case. This is the results that you sent me, okay, 11 results. And as you can see, your, your breakaway forces, on average, is a, are about 17 kilograms, more or less 3 kilograms of standard error. So as you can see, there is no big variability. Indeed, I separated the values that you sent me uh, corresponding to air shocks and coil shocks. And as you can see, by comparing air shocks with coil shocks, the breakaway forces are really similar, okay? I did the statistical analysis and it's not different, okay? The coil shocks and air shocks have a very similar breakaway force. The fact that there is no significant difference between coil and air shocks is really interesting and uh, I was not expecting, expecting these, these results, okay? And these results strongly suggest that in air shock there is no breakaway force for the air spring, okay? So, considering the magnitude of these breakaway forces from your suspensions and also from mine suspension, this magnitude of values are really and very compatible with the forces that we saw in this episode produced by the IFP uh, uh, pressure. Okay, so overall these results strongly suggest that the breakaway force of, of uh, your suspensions came mainly from the IFP pressure and not from the spring breakaway force. To reduce the amount of breakaway force produced by FP, there are some companies that are using different strategies. For instance, the iron shocks, they, use a, they can use a very, very low uh, IFP pressure without affecting the performance of the shock. They, so they use about 30 psi of pressure and that produces a very low amount of breakaway force to start compressing the shock. Another strategy uh, is used by the rock shock in, the, in the, their vivid uh, shocks. They use a, a negative spring, a, a negative coil spring uh, behind, behind the main piston. Okay? So by using that, they are also eliminating the breakaway force produced by the IFP. I don't know if this system works, because I do not have a vivid to test, but it seems, it seems a quite interesting concept. Okay, so the take-home message of this episode is that the IFP is the main responsible for the breakaway force in your rear suspension, and also that although IFP does not contribute hugely to the overall spring, spring rate uh, of your shock, it does contribute with around 10 to 20 percent depending uh, on your situation. Okay, so I hope that you liked this episode. In the next episode it will be the episode number 10 and I, I have a surprise for you, so stay tuned guys and see you next time. Bye!